get started. We've got an exciting program for you today. It's hashtag Fossil Friday here at the museum, and we're celebrating today by chatting with paleontologists, our experts in ancient life, who are right now, this very moment, in the field, digging up uh, signs of ancient life. They're looking for fossils in the hills and valleys of Montana right now. And uh, when our teams go out searching for fossils, we like to give them a call, check in on them. And so joining me now to give us an update on what's been going on this summer, if they've made any interesting finds, uh, chatting a little bit about what it's like to be a paleontologist, what it's like to work in the field. Is it exciting to find dinosaurs? These are questions that we can get answers to with museum paleontologist Eric Lund, who joins me now from the field in Montana. Eric, hello. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. How have you been? Uh, it's great to be seen. We've been really good. Team's been working really hard. We've uh, had two sites going at the same time. Um, we found uh, some bones, um, but <laughs> the finding's been been a little slow this year, but it's it's great. We're all doing great. Excellent, excellent. That is good to hear. Uh, hey, if you're here in the Daily Planet Theater with me, how are y'all doing today? Excellent stuff. So, uh, if you're here with me in the theater at the museum in downtown Raleigh, or if you're watching online, I want you all to know that you can ask your questions as well. So stick around here in just a moment. I'm going to be looking to all of you. Any questions you have about dinosaurs, paleontology, working at a museum, working in the field, you can ask your questions. Uh, if you're in the room with me, you'll just wave at me. And if you want to, you can even come here with me, get on camera and use the microphone and talk to Eric yourself. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, type your questions into the chat. I've got that pulled up and I'll be looking to you for your thoughts and questions and comments as well. So don't miss out on this really cool and exciting opportunity. But Eric, let's get to you. Tell us where you are exactly in Montana and what you've been working on. Yep. So uh, we are in eastern Montana right now. Um, we're standing in the Hill Creek Formation, uh, which represents a time period uh, right at the end of the time of the dinosaurs. So we're late Cretaceous. Um, we're dealing with about we're dealing with the time period from about 69 to 66 million years ago. Um, so right uh, at the the end of the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and so we've got. Uh, these badlands out here, they're beautiful. It's a, a series, a, a sequence of stacked mudstones and sandstones that represent ancient environments that uh, were here uh, when uh, North America was divided in two by an interior seaway. So we had mountains being built to the west, and this whole area was just covered with big rivers uh, and ponds and swamps uh, right next to uh, this interior seaway. And dinosaurs were just roaming up and down this oceanfront property. Oceanfront property. It sounds like a great place to be a dinosaur. It would have been a great place to be a dinosaur, albeit maybe a little scary. Oh, scary? Why Why do you think so? Yeah, so one of the sites that we were digging up this year was a Tyrannosaurus rex. So Tyrant King, king of the dinosaurs. Um, it unfortunately... Uh, was not in a convenient spot. From camp, we had to hike two miles uh, away uh, to get to it. Um, and some of our days were up above 100 degrees. So carrying everything we needed into that site was uh, was a bit uh, trying. But, um, you know, we did it, and it was great. Uh, and we got uh, a few bits and pieces of this animal. Um, we've closed it down for this season, but we right at the end, yesterday, we were finding a few more bits. Um, so there's reason to come back. Uh, next year and see if we can find more. Eric, I'll say that uh, when you said Tyrannosaurus Rex, like everybody in the theater, like everybody's jaws drop. <laughs> T-Rex, that sounds exciting. Is it really exciting to find dinosaurs like that and to start excavating and discovering that you have, you know, the Tyrant Lizard King? Oh, absolutely. And that's that's one of the exciting things about this job is just the discovery and exploration looking for these things out in the badlands, And then once you find something and dig in, you are the first person to see that bone. 
in 69 to 66 million years. So it's it's absolutely fantastic. But tell me a little bit about having to hike two miles in a hundred degree plus desert weather. Yeah. To find it. So we we everyone was carrying uh maybe 60 to 70 pound packs, all of our tools, all the water, all the plaster, burlap, everything. Um, and we have to drop off the plateau, go all the way to the bottom of the creek and come all the way back up. Uh, so <laughs> there was a lot of uh, vertical relief, a lot of climbing that had to be, do, had to be done. Um, one of the trails to get off the top of the plateau is, is merely just a deer trail. Uh, and it's pretty steep. You're on a sheer cliff kind of scrambling down. Um, so there were some pucker pucker moments as you're carrying all this weight on your back. Um, but, you know, for for the tyrant lizard king, it was it was worth it. Now, when you say you find a dinosaur uh, in the rock out there, it's six nine million years old, maybe. And then you start to uncover it. Are you finding, did you find like an entire T-Rex skeleton laid out for you? Like I think of one, you know, on exhibit inside a museum. Is kind of like that what you found or is it different? No. So this site um, okay. is disarticulated, meaning that the bones aren't in life position. So everything is sort of really spread out um, and we find pockets of bones. So it's, uh, it's not like Jurassic Park where they walk up with the machine and shoot the shotgun shell and on the screen is a beautiful, completely articulated specimen. Um, this site was found uh, by a bit of the, the condyles. So the knee joint actually was sticking, just the bottom of the femur, the upper leg bone was sticking out of the hill. Um, there was also some other bits around. We found a tyrannosaur tooth, uh, maybe some uh, fragments of rib shaft, uh, but that's how we found the site. And then when we dug in, um, the femur was nearly complete and then we got one of the back vertebrae, a dorsal vertebrae, right next to that. Uh, but when we, so we dug a really big hole in, in hopes of finding uh, more of this animal. But um, turns out there was so far what we got are just a few pieces. Well, that leads me to another question then. Out in the field, how did you know that it was a T-Rex? Yep. So we didn't know exactly what it was uh, right when we found it. We just saw... We knew it was a big limb bone because we saw those condyles um, sticking out. But it wasn't until we dug in and exposed the bone that we saw that it was uh, an upper leg bone. And then because of its shape and size, uh, we knew that it was uh, a theropod. And one of the only, the only big theropod out here in the Hell Creek is Tyrannosaurus rex. Okay, so that makes the identification a little bit easier. Yep. So you said, uh, you mentioned at the top that there were two discoveries or two quarries that you were working on. So we've got the T-Rex. Uh, what was the second one? Yep. So the second one's behind me here. Um, so this site was found a couple years ago, and this site has gone through some evolution. So it started out as a tiny crocodile site. That's how the site was found. It was a tiny crocodile on the surface. So we started to dig around that to collect it. And then we started finding bones of a, a very young individual with Triceratops. So then last year we came and we dug in and found 50 some odd bones to this very young individual at Triceratops. Uh, I say young individual, we're talking maybe two or three years old. So I've, I've been calling it the baby, baby Triceratops quarry. Uh, but this year we came back and we dug a big hole and we only found a few bits and pieces, a bit of a rib, uh, maybe a carp hole, um, but the finding of that specimen seems to have been played out already. But one of the cool things we did find is behind me here in this giant jacket. Uh, so this is a field jacket. It's just made of plaster and burlap. And inside this jacket is a nearly complete palm frond. This palm frond uh, is over eight feet long. Um, and I have been told by uh, a paleobotanist that this is uh, one of the best palm fronds to ever come out of the Hell Creek. So... Uh, we won't get it fully collected this year just because it's too big and we're running out of time. We only got two more field days, um, but we'll get a, a solid cap on it and get it ready. So when we come back next year, we can finish off the jacket and hire a helicopter to fly it out. That is incredible. You said an eight foot long palm frond. Tell yep. me a little bit about why that would be so significant to find. 
compared to like say the dinosaurs that you maybe were looking for as well? Yeah, so the plant material doesn't preserve like bone. You know, it doesn't have any hard parts. Uh, the palm frond in particular is very uh, woody and fibrous. Um, but all we got is an impression that the actual plant material has either been carbonized or really it's just a, a film on the surface. So it's very, very delicate. And oftentimes these things just do not preserve. They preserve if we... Uh, the other palm fronds that I've seen from this formation are just tiny bits of leaves and that's it. But we got the whole thing. We got the full uh, fan of leaves uh, and we got the full stock all the way down. So this one's really exciting. And so you want to collect this one. It's like really exciting because this doesn't happen. But also what does like what does having a palm frond back here at the museum in Raleigh uh, help us learn about compared to, you know, the things that I think we might all think about when it comes to paleontology, which are like the dinosaurs that go on exhibit. Yep. So this, this palm frond would have been the food for the dinosaurs that are out here. Um, and so it's really exciting in that sense. It gives us an idea of what the environment was like. So right now you come out here and it's very desert-like uh, and the vegetation has changed. We're now into sagebrush and juniper pine forests. Uh, and everything is very dry. But way back then, it was it was very tropical, very green, very verdant, um, again, very wet. Uh, and so having this palm frond gives us an idea of what the past was like here, what these animals ate. Um, and and uh, it, it gives us a better picture of the entire environment. It is crazy to think about uh, like Eastern Montana, which looks like desert with some scrubby forest being just this incredibly like tropical style environment that you would pull a palm frond out of out of the ground. Yep, yep. It's pretty amazing uh that this preserved for one and that we found the whole thing. Uh and that it can give us uh clues to to the past. So uh at what point in the quarrying discovery phase is the team at right now? Are you getting started? Are you wrapping things up? Yeah, we're wrapping things up. Um, we've been out here for nearly three weeks. We got two more active days in the field. So we're just about done, uh, which is, is exciting, but also a little bittersweet because um, there's still lots of things out here to discover. Um, and, you know, we're still working on getting this palm frond in a place where it's going to be stable over winter. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're on the back end. We're, we're about wrapped up here. It looks like you've got a great team there working with you. Uh, could, can you introduce everybody to us? Can we say hi to the team? Yeah. Hey, everybody, wave. Yeah, so we got, uh, we got a student from uh, Italy, from Rome, Italy. Uh, we've got uh, student and staff from the museum there out here. Uh, and we have volunteers from California, from uh, D.C., and from Utah. Uh, and they've been a great crew. Um, Force them to carry heavy, heavy packs. Uh, no one's complained. So, yeah, it's it's a great crew. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, folks, hey, if you're here with me in the theater and you've got questions, you can just wave at me and we can call on you. You can yell your questions or you can even come over here and talk to Eric directly on the stream. Uh, and I see one question. What is the background and how long have you been at the museum and how did you know you can Ooh, okay, Eric, it's a good question. Uh, how long have you been with the museum? When did you know you wanted to be a paleontologist? And basically, how did you get into this kind of work? Yeah, so I've wanted to be a paleontologist since I was three. I was one of those kids that sort of had all the dinosaur toys and books uh, and never grew up. I'm still the same. I still have all the dinosaur toys and books. Uh, so that's how uh, I've wanted, this is what I've wanted to do since a wee, a wee lad. Um, uh, I have a background in geology um, and uh, biological sciences. Um, and so when I got to university, I was better at rocks than I was at biology then. So I got uh, two degrees in geology, um, working on my last one in biological sciences. Um, and I've been at the museum since the summer of 2018. They said that's cool. <laughs> 
other questions for Eric, just wave me down or jump up and down or yell at me. Say, hey, Chris, I have a question. Uh, there are one or two things coming in online for you. Where is your favorite place in the world to look for fossils? Yeah, so one of my favorite places, uh, besides here in the Hell Creek, is the Kaparowitz Basin in southern Utah. Uh, just the rocks and uh, flora and fauna that we find there are absolutely amazing. Um, and we still don't fully understand what that ecosystem was like. So that's, that's one of my favorite places to dig. Very, very cool. What are your favorite things to find when you're on a dig? Oh, I mean, just fossils in general, um, but I'm I'm a horned dinosaur specialist, so anytime I can find something like Triceratops or uh, another horned dinosaur, um, those are my favorite things to find. Um, but everything you find is just amazing, from small little bits of teeth to giant plant fronds to to beautiful leaves, um, turtle bits. Like it's all it's all amazing because you're you know some of the you are the first person to see those things in millions of years, so it's pretty great. So I can see on the camera, uh, the team has got their hands in a big bucket of some kind of slurry. Can you walk <laughs> us through, and you mentioned like the jacket and putting the cast over this palm frond fossil. Can you talk us through the process? Like what's the actual field work that you've got to do? Yep, so absolutely. So once we find a bone, then we've got to expose it uh, on, on its entire uh, entire top surface. Once we have the entire top surface exposed, then we've got to trench around it. So now your bone or your palm frond in this case is sitting on a pedestal of rock. So then you start to undercut that pedestal just a little bit to give yourself a lip so that when you put the plaster and burlap around, it's, it, that, that covering's got something to grab onto. So um, in pedestaling it, now your bone or plant material, whatever it is you're collecting is sitting on a mushroom of rock. So you got the top part of the mushroom with the bone and then your pedestal is getting smaller and smaller. Once we get it to that point, then we got to put a separator layer because if you just put the plaster and burlap right on the bone or the plant frond, it will bond to it and you'll never get it off. So in this case, for this jacket, we used paper towel. So we just wet paper towel, fold it up and place it on there. And it creates that, that layer of separation that when we get this thing back in the lab and we open it up, the plaster will come off. Uh, like basically taking, taking the top off of a pot. Um, and then we just have burlap um, a big bolt of burlap that we've cut into strips and we mix up uh, plaster of Paris or in this case a, a, a specific kind called hydrocal and we just dip the, the bandages in that plaster and then start spreading them on until you build up that entire cap uh, over the fossil um, and in this case this one's so big I don't know if you can see it but we've had to put uh, pieces of wood in there just to strengthen it so we got a couple pieces of wood in there which is going to help keep that jacket from flexing. Um, and we'll put, it'll probably take about a thousand pounds of plaster to get this thing collected. 500 on the top. Um, and then once this cap is finished and sufficiently thick, we'll break it off the pedestal and flip it over completely. And we'll uh, complete the process by capping that bottom side. That is amazing. I didn't realize it was going to be a thousand pounds of plaster already on top of a several thousand pound rock. Yeah, this one's gonna be big. That's incredible. Uh, a question that came in for you, what are the risks of leaving the fossil over winter? Yeah, so if you don't put a proper cap on it, um, you could risk having the water damage it. Um, but then in this case, once this cap is completely cured and solid, we can, we can leave it out over winter. Um, in our case, we're going to bury it back in just so it's a bit protected from the weather. And when we come back next year, we'll have to dig it back out. Um, but if we were to just leave the fossils, they'll, they'll be subjected to the freeze thaw and, and the weathering that occurs out here pretty rapidly. So we got to protect it. Um, so put this cap on it. We'll put a uh, tarp over that and we'll bury it in. Um, so it sort of makes it look like um, it's a sort of a natural contour to the land. Very cool. Another one for you. Do you have a sense of how near your location is to the KPG boundary? And maybe you can tell us what that boundary is as well. Yeah, absolutely. So as I stand right here, we're about 60 feet below the KPG boundary. So we're actually really, really close. 
Um, the KPG stands for the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary. That is the boundary at which 75% uh, of all life on Earth went extinct right at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and so probably can't see it really well behind me because uh, tarp is in the way, yellow tarp is in the way. Uh, but the boundary here in this area is very quite visible. Um, and at this boundary is where uh, you get a small volcanic ash layer sandwiched between two big coal veins. Um, and in that volcanic ash, we get that spike in iridium. And iridium doesn't occur in great quantities naturally on Earth. And so it is known that uh, because we have such a big spike in iridium, that this must have been an extraterrestrial source. So it signifies uh, the time right at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, where below that boundary we have dinosaurs, and above that boundary we just have modern birth. Thank you very much. Another question from the audience. Ooh, good question. What is your most essential field item? Um, most essential field item. Um, that one's a bit hard. Granola to bars. Do. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, in this case, because it's been so hot, we've had several days over 100 degrees. Water has been very, very essential for us. <laughs> Water and electrolytes. <laughs> okay, excellent. Let's. Uh, we're going to drill down a little bit. Uh, tell me about some of the tools that you use and what you feel like you couldn't live without. Yeah, so... Um, we use everything from small dental picks all the way up to jackhammer and rock saw and everything in between. So at this site, the rock is relatively soft. It's a, it's a nice mudstone. So just uh, a nice rock hammer and an awl uh, has really come in handy. At the Tyrannosaur site, it was in a sandstone. Uh, and so we had to bust out the rock saw and actually cut the rock in order for us to break it. Um, but we also uh, use shovels uh regular picks and and uh and things like that um so uh our paleontology field kit mostly has uh uh some some scissors nice pair of scissors to help cut the burlap uh some dental picks some awls uh a nice paintbrush so we can gently brush off the bones um and then another thing that we carry around is our consolidant uh, so we use B72 out here, which is just a plastic bead. We dissolve in acetone uh, and use that to help uh, consolidate the bone and help hold it together as we excavate it. Cool stuff. So another question from the chat for you. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know about the difference between using aluminum foil versus the wet paper towels for the separator. I've seen yeah, both so cats that we have here at the museum for sure. Yep. Uh, so that's sort of personal preference. Uh, personally, I hate aluminum foil. I, I don't <laughs> like its use um, for several reasons. One, it tears. It's really thin. Um, and, and if you get a tear that you don't know, the plaster can seep underneath. Uh, and then it's really sort of hard to get off the bone. Um, another one is if if uh, foil gets creased, it makes a sharp, hard, uh, hard edge uh, that can damage the bone. So I much prefer... Uh, wet paper towels, uh, but there are a lot of folks who use uh, aluminum foil um, because it's fast. You can roll out a sheet, press it down, uh, and have your thing covered as opposed to the time-consuming fold the paper towel, wet it, and, and push it on. Excellent. Awesome. If you're just joining us online or here in the Daily Planet Theater in downtown Raleigh, welcome. We're chatting with museum paleontologists and the uh, lab manager for the almost brand new SECU Dino Lab, which is bringing the dueling dinosaurs to the museum, Eric Lund. He's with us right now in the field in Montana, where, as you can see, they're working on digging up fossils to bring back to the museum. If you've got questions, you can wave at me, and then uh, we'll ask your questions for Eric. Anything you want to know about ancient life, dinosaurs, paleontology, working in the field, or working here in a museum, uh, and if you're watching online, of course, you can ask questions as well, like this one. What about the students? How do they feel to be there looking to their future as paleontologists? I don't know, guys. How do you feel about being here and looking to your future as paleontologists?
They all say they're having a lot of fun, even though I make them stick their hands in gooey plaster and carry heavy bags. I know, I was thinking somebody <laughs> had to carry the rocks up two miles to that Tyrannosaur quarry, didn't they? It was yeah, a, it was me. <laughs> a good leader always picks the heaviest bag, right? All right, let's see here. Well, uh, uh, tell, we're all wishing them luck. They should stick with it. It looks like they're doing a great job. All right, here's another one for you. I'm going to read this one out. One of the most recent findings has to do with some dinosaurs having feathers. Can you talk about how we might know the truth and if there's an evolutionary separation there? Is there a, is the jury out on feathered dinosaurs, Eric? It is not. So there have been multiple specimens, mostly from China, preserving beautiful feather impressions. Um, and so we, we definitely know that at least some, some uh, dinosaurs did have feathers. Um, and so that's, that's pretty well uh, substantiated. Um, and it just shows us that there is that link between modern birds today. Uh, or another uh, sign of evidence between modern uh, the linkage between modern birds and uh, dinosaurs. Awesome stuff. How are you planning to get that giant specimen back to the museum? Yep. So uh, when we come back next year, um, we'll continue the process of getting it fully encased in that plaster jacket. Uh, then we'll have to flip it over, and when we do that, we'll flip it over into a helicopter net, uh, and then we'll hi we'll get a, a helicopter out here to hook up to it, fly it out to a trailer, um, and then we'll have to drive it back to North Carolina. Nice. So uh, your team there doesn't have to load it up and haul it back themselves. No, no. Uh, early on, when I thought it was just a portion of a, a palm, I was like, oh, we can carry that out. But then it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I was like, nope, we're going to have to hire a helicopter. Nick wants to know, what's the most surprising thing you found or learned this field season? Most surprising thing? Um, well, honestly, it's this palm frond. Like I said, I've uh, previous years out here, I've been working in the Hell Creek since 2018. And mostly find just small fragments of palm frond which in and of themselves are very neat, but to have a nearly complete one preserved here in uh, what was a Triceratops quarry uh, was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and so that, that this season is, that's probably the most uh, exciting thing. Super. I can't wait to see it at some point, whenever it gets here and gets un uh, uncovered in the museum, that's going to be an exciting one. To take a look at, which I'll uh, I'll say here and for everybody watching too, I think uh, there are pictures of this fossil that are on the internet now. If they go find, I think it was your Twitter account, Eric. You posted some photos. Yep, uploaded to Twitter, or I guess it's now X. Uploaded to X uh, as well as uh, Instagram. So <laughs> perfect. Uh, can you tell us uh, what's your handle so that folks can? Find yeah, it's Buana underscore Lund, B W A N underscore L U N D. Thanks much. Okay, another question that came in for you What's your daily schedule in the field look like? Yep, so I'm early riser, so I get up uh, before the sun, get coffee going. Um, we had a little bit uh, of a strange schedule this field summer because we had a film crew out here filming everything that we did for two weeks um, uh, it, for an upcoming documentary that will be released uh, in a couple of years. So that was pretty exciting, but it also meant uh, for a very strange schedule. So normal schedule, uh, get up, have coffee, make breakfast, uh, and then get out to the site, hopefully before the heat really sets in. Uh, and then, yeah, we just start quarrying. Um, occasionally we'll get to prospect a bit, which means going out and looking for new fossils eroding out of the ground. Uh, we usually work until, uh, about six, 6 PM, then head back up the hill to camp. Uh, everyone sort of relaxes. Um, then we cook dinner, sort of hang out. Um, and we have beautiful night skies out here. Um, and we're, uh, sort of, uh, on the tail end of the meteor showers. And so we've been watching, uh, some beautiful shooting stars happening. Uh, overhead. Although I don't know if that'll happen today. It's a bit cloudy for the first time in ever. Um, 
<laughs> and so, yeah, that's sort of a normal day. And then just wa wash, rinse, repeat, uh, get ready to do it all over again. Yeah, I have to say, it sounds like a lot of work, but the work comes with a lot of reward. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the days are long, putting in 12, 13 hour days, sometimes even longer, um, sunrise to sunset. But uh, I find it very rewarding. Uh, and it's it's sort of my place to recharge uh, out here um, in, in the field. So yeah, it, it's great. So a few more days in the field, you said you're covering over some of the sites, uh, so making sure that they're all safe until we can get back to them. Will the team return to these sites in Montana next summer? Yep, so we'll we'll return to these same exact sites next summer uh, and open them up again. Uh, this one to collect this palm, once we get the palm out of the way, hopefully we find more of this baby Triceratops. Uh, but if not, that's okay, we got this beautiful palm out of here. Um, for the T-Rex site, um, we'll get that. The bones seem to be trending in the opposite direction that I dug the big hole. So we'll start focusing on the other side uh, and uh, hopefully keep finding more bone uh, going the opposite direction. It sounds great. Uh, I'm going to look one more time. It looks like we're doing okay here. Uh, Eric, thank you for joining us. Thank you for calling in. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, the opportunity. Be safe out there. Everybody take care of yourselves. Mind the heat for us. We want everybody to stay safe. Yes, we will. Will do. Folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you for joining us online or here inside the Daily Planet Theater to chat with our paleontologist, Eric Lund, and the team out in Montana. Uh, they're going to be making their way back to Raleigh, North Carolina, or back to their respective homes and institutions soon. Uh, Eric, we'll look forward to seeing you back here in Raleigh and uh, yep. with, you know, backpacks full of fossils. That's right. Yep. Sounds good. Everybody, Goodbye, thanks everybody. for tuning in to today's program. Uh, make sure that you're following the Museum of Natural Sciences on social media. We're at Natural Sciences anywhere you want to look for us. And you can check out naturalsciences.org, the museum's website, where you can see updates, news, and events that are all coming up soon here at the museum. Programs just like this one, where you can engage with science. So I hope that we'll see you all again here, either at the museum or online, wherever you happen to be. And don't miss out. If you visit the Museum of Natural Sciences here downtown, uh, you might be able to spot Eric. You just peek through the glass windows of the Paleontology Research Lab on the third floor here. And not only might you see our paleontologist hard at work inside the lab, but you might be able to see some of the incredible fossils that they're bringing back as well. And of course, it goes without saying that uh, Eric is in charge of the Dueling Dinosaur Project, which is coming to the museum soon next year. So uh, I think we're gonna be hearing from and seeing a lot more of you, Eric, as we gear up for that exciting paleontology project. Yep. Looking forward to it. All right, everybody. That'll do it for today. Thanks. Take care. Be safe. Be kind. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.